Welcome to Higher Praise. Yes, give God some praise in his house. Amen. We have the privilege to, to worship a, a loving God, and it is a, a privilege, even though those who try to fight and take it away. But we worship the awe-inspiring living God, and it's not by accident that you're here. Maybe you're here because deliverance has sought you out. You know, when we're in the presence of God, you know, if God waited on us to seek out deliverance, he'd be waiting a long time, but sometimes deliverance seeks us out and shows up, and a lot of times uh, we get afraid of the deliverance, so we turn around and run the other way, but deliverance has a way of just apprehending you. Turning your world upside down, shaking that mess out of you, and all you can say is, I had an encounter with Jesus. Because I praise God that, see, he still fights to deliver. He fights for his children. What a blessing it is to be under the authority of Jesus Christ, who went through everything that we could ever go through and more, and came out victorious. And man, I don't know about you, but that's a bad, bad, bad man or God who can sit there and just uh, take death on the chin and get back up and say, how you like me now? You know what I'm talking about? We serve a mighty, mighty risen Savior. So look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't act like Jesus ain't strong. <laughs> you know he's strong. See, you know, some of y'all sitting back and act like uh, Jesus still in, still in diapers. You know, uh, Jesus grew up. You know what? He's a strong man. He lifted the world on his shoulders and set it free. Don't tell me he can't go into your situation right now and turn that joker around for your good and his glory. You say, oh, my God, I'm so overwhelmed. God said, I didn't tell you to hold all that stuff. Quit trying to be me. Just follow me. Okay, see? Quit trying to be me and follow me. God wants to loose you today. He does. I don't know who's in the house or who's in the room, but God wants to loose you today. He wants your, if you are... Um, Obedient enough and have the courage to humble yourself to receive the deliverance. Some of us, we think we're doing good because I don't want to trouble Jesus. I take care of this on my own. You're wearing out everybody else around you because they wish you, they praying that you surrender. But you're trying to hold it all together, and there's 50 people, oh, Lord, just make them surrender. Lord, make her surrender. Make her surrender. You holding up the progress. Sometimes you have to bow your head and say, Jesus, you got this one. Jesus, take this one from me. Jesus, I can't do this. I can't be everywhere my kids are. Jesus, you got to, you got to fill in the gaps where I'm, where I'm not there. Jesus, I can't be in... Uh, every place. I can't be all knowing God. What I what I what I don't know, take care of me and teach me. God, what I what I what I can't grasp, God, you hold on to. And God, what I'm in, what I'm afraid to let go of, God, take it from me. Come on, somebody. Feel a little little a little breaking in the atmosphere right now. I don't know who this is this is for. You showed up just to receive this today. Just to receive this, this, this breaking. Some of you have this shell that's no thicker than an egg shell you're trying to protect, but you think because you hard boiled, ain't nothing gonna crack it. You think if I'm hard on the inside, maybe my outside won't show. Oh, it's all cracked. We got we all we all see it. When we try to tell you that 
your flesh is showing, you try to just argue and say, no, it's not. But if we would just humble ourselves before God and say, God, take this stuff away from me as far as the east is from the west. Only then will I realize how I walk with you and talk with you and love you, Jesus. We've been in this thing. I've been pastoring for almost 24 years, and God is just as good today as he was the first day. I sit on the platform. Yeah. Probably even more real today than he was there before because I've grown more, more wiser and seeing him in every place he goes. And that's everywhere I am. He, he, he follows me in my life. But just not me, but you. He, he's taking risk. He's following you through this life. When we say we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that means he personally knows you. He personally sees you. He personally loves you. Now, as we go into our, our prayer time real quick, I want to um, got some um, prayer requests. I had a brother, um, Chris, and his girlfriend goes here, but he's in the hospital. He has um, things in his lungs, blood clots in his lungs, and we're praying for him. Ed and, Beth, uh, Ed and Becky Huffman, who, who moved away, used to go here. He, he sent me a thing asking if, if our church would pray for his uh, grand son yet to be born. The mother hasn't got a really good thing, but uh, report, but she says if you would pray for Malachi Huffman, who is yet to be born, if you would agree with them in prayer for that he comes out a healthy, healthy young man, a young baby, I said, yes, we'll do that. We'll pray for a lot of people. You see that ministers, a lot of them are, are preaching or ministering different, different places, and Brother Dennis got called out uh, a couple minutes ago to be chaplain of someone who um, mother passed away. And there's just a lot of things going on. Will you join me in prayer today? Father, as we pray for this service, Father, when we praying for those who are watching over the Internet, God, that you would touch those that are hurting and sick and ill. Touch those that are traveling and watching from different places and different times. Pray for our prayer requests. We've lifted up for these um, young man who's fighting for his life in the hospital. We ask God that you would clear his lungs and clear his body. For the young baby who hasn't yet to be born, Father, that you go into his mother's womb and you correct anything that may have been shown up that's wrong. Father, we know that you, when we were yet in our mother's womb, you knew us. Amen. Father, that you would touch them. Father, those who are, who are sick and struggling among us, we ask God that you would bless them and keep them. Father, I ask that we pray for our prayers and our prayer jars that's been put in there by individuals and that you would touch each and every prayer request. And Father, I ask that the spirit of deliverance would stay in this house, Father. And God, that those who need it, Father, will receive it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen and amen. God bless you. Amen. Good to see you guys. Good to um, have you guys in the uh, house of the Lord. If you're visiting for the first time, I want to say thank you for visiting. If you didn't, if you'd fill out one of those visitors things, that way we know and we know how to pray for you or whatever. And um, if you feel the spirit of God and we're able to, to bless you, we ask that you maybe you would come back, bring, bring somebody with you. And if you're watching online, if the service bless you, we ask you to watch again. If you want a partnership with us, you can download our app and you can give through our app. You can um, get updates on what we're doing here at the um, worship center. So we're excited about all the different possibilities. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and release kids for Children's Church at this time. So can we go ahead and do that? Amen. And while they're, while they're doing that, I just want to say again, um, we're thankful to exist for, for 24 years. Amen. Amen. 
there's a lot of um, churches younger than us, a lot of churches older than us that didn't make it through COVID, amen? And, and, and we're still here, we're still alive and kicking, we're still ministering to the word of God to the best of our ability, and we praise God for that. And our fellowship hall's uh, almost close, close to being done, amen? These guys, yes, these guys are putting some hard work in. Uh, please remember, we're still uh, accepting gifts for that. We still got to get some chairs, and we got some tables in, so I got to get some chairs, um, pick some chairs out and stuff. But God is doing good. It should be up and going for Robert Day when he has his big karate tournament here. So I guess it's going to be a lot of people here. They're coming from, from Evansville and Muncie and everything else, all these kids, so, so they can kick each other in the face. But we call it kick for Christ. Let Robert Day go and they kick him in the face. This for Jesus. But we're just, but we're, uh, but we're good about that. And the and the kids are for camp. If you want to know more about camp, you need to see uh, Sheila Rude. Amen. She'll fill you in more about. I think we got 15 or 16 kids going to camp so far. Yep. And if you want to know more about the camps like that, uh, get with them. Uh, they'll be selling the concessions. Um, at the karate tournament, and that's going to go to help send kids, more kids to camp and for the youth, something like this. And so God is really on the move. Amen. Praise God. Good. I'm picking up from where we left off last week, and we were talking about the Christian life. Amen. Um, uh, I believe this is an exhaustive study. This is just some things that I think that in this Christian life that we need to understand and we need, we need to know now. And as, and as I, I left off saying last week, and I'll start saying this week, when you've come and you've given your life to Jesus Christ, God saved your soul, not your flesh. That's because we're still warring with this thing that we're in. We're still warring with our flesh, our fleshly desires, whatever. Because remember, your body doesn't go to heaven. God gives you a new body. Amen. Gives you a glorified body. So, um, and, we, and we discovered in the last couple of, of teachings that God expects us to get ourselves together and then follow him. And that doesn't mean that you got to save yourself. God says you need to crucify your flesh, then take up your cross and follow me. God didn't say, get your fleshly self and follow me. You're no good in the battle if you're in your flesh because you don't have the armor on, you don't have anything else because in the battle, all you're going to think about is you. Mm -hmm. So you get your flesh under control then you can go into the spiritual battle and be more than a conqueror. But as you are in the flesh, you are that one that the devil seeks to devour and destroy. Remember, the devil can't destroy everybody. He looks for when you in your flesh and then when you get in your flesh, it's like a dinner bell, go, dinner bell goes off and it's, it's lunchtime for the enemy. Because he can lie to you, manipulate you while you're in your flesh. But when you're in your spirit, not today, devil. And let me check my calendar. Tomorrow don't look good either. Come on. Amen. So we, we have to understand that, that in this part that we have to, because a lot of times we are contributing things to the devil, that's us. The devil wished he was omnipresent. He's not. He just, he just, he's a, a very good uh, delegator. He's a created being. He's not like God. He's not the opposite of God. He's a created being, was an angel. He can only be in one place at one time. What he does is he delegates. He has, he has principalities and generals in different places over um, things. But the way y'all tell it, he was at your house at the same time at 9 o'clock. Oh, the devil's at my house at 9 o'clock. Girl, he was at your house too. You call, your, you call your cousin up down in Alabama. What's your devil been messing with me too? Boy, he quick, ain't he? No. Half of that is us. A lot of times the devil don't even mess with us because our flesh doesn't work for him. All right. You got jealous. It wasn't necessarily the devil. It was you. All right. Y'all ain't, ain't ready for that. I'm going to go ahead because I want y'all throwing stuff at me because we don't throw stuff at me on anniversary. Let's, let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5. I'm going to start at verse 17. That's why I said, baby, verse 5, verse 17. <laughs> yes, right. We got it. All right. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? He is a new creation. 
Okay, then you wonder, like, what happened to the old one of you? But remember how I said that um, God, uh, a couple weeks ago, how he reversed a curse? It's all through the Bible if you look for it. Okay, he is a new creation, right? Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So let me stop there. Why are you a new creation? Because the one who did the first creation remade you again. Because it says God created man, breathed into him, he became a living soul. Then that living soul in the Garden of Eden got corrupted. So we got all the sin. They let the dogs out. The devil came on in. We were disobedient. Look in Genesis. But then now he says, you are a new creation. You're not after the old creation. So the creator restored you with a new creation. So if you are in Jesus, you are a new creation because you have something that you didn't have before you knew him. And what you got of this Holy Spirit that's in you makes you so fundamentally different on the inside from the person who doesn't know him. You might say, you could be twins and your twin sister not know him, and you do. On the outside, you may look alike, but you're so fundamentally different because you're a new creation on the inside. Okay? I want everybody to do that. Let's go, wow. That's how awesome that is. Just in case y'all didn't know, I want to help y'all out. Okay. Behold, all things have become new. Now, uh, verse 18. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, listen, I'm going to go back a little bit with that. And and unless you're going to say the saved are not just forgiven, they are changed into a new creation. You got to understand, we're not just forgiven, we're changed. And I, w- I want to show you why that's a big deal for your Christian experience. Okay, have you ever forgiven somebody of something and then you see them a two or three weeks later and realize they ain't changed? God don't work that way. We're not only forgiven, we're changed. So God could, could forgive you all the time, but with no change, that you're still going to be destined for hell because you ain't changing. But when you have an encounter with Jesus, change is going to come. Change is inevitable. So not only has he forgiven you, he's changed you. Because now people will tell you, you ain't even saying that's a dude, what's, what's going on? You're just different. You'll say, no, I, no, I ain't different. I'm changed. There's when people say, man, you used to cuss all the time and you don't hang out with them. Man, you just you just all that Christian, you just different, dude. I'm changed. Now, listen, change. He didn't say he made you perfect. He said he changed you. Perfection. And listen, everyone here is going to know perfection, but you got to take your suit off to know it. Because you can't live in something that's imperfect and claim perfection. But once you shed off corruptible, put on incorruptible, see, listen, you are destined for perfection. Now, this should make all my OCD people just so happy. I don't know why my wife ain't taking a lap or something. You know, all you, I'm sorry, all you OCD people, she's like, I'm going to be perfect. Because you are destined to walk in perfection because you have been changed. So what you do is the devil tries to get you down because now when you walk in change and you, you desire to be the righteousness of Jesus Christ and every time you fall short in your flesh, the devil's like, see, you ain't changed. But the devil has always been a liar. And the reason, only reason why the devil would whisper to you that you're not changed is because he's worried because he knows you are. And if he, and if you find out that you've been changed, you dangerous. You're, you're dangerous. Um, do you know there's quite, they, they do this a lot with, with a, lot of, a lot of cars and, and, and stuff. You know, people say, well, how fast does that car go or whatever like this? Do you know that a lot of cars, um, depending on what it is, at the factory, the makers of the cars 
detune them or they put caps on them or governors so they can only go so fast. Now, if you get a little, if you get a little, now the new ones, you get a little chip, whatever, you unlock that, then you'll get more horsepower, I guess. But they put governors on it because they want to do that so that um, they can meet those EPA regulations for how many miles per gallon and, and, and stuff like this. And, and like you said, man, I, you know, well, I got this big VA and I only got it rated for, uh, I bet it'll do more than 120. Oh, they done capped it. Okay. Some, some for safety, some for, um, so it doesn't burn through the engine anymore. I mean, there's me and different reasons why sometimes he put caps on them. But the thing about it is the devil wants to put a cap on your strength if he can. If you ever found out that you could run stronger in your spirit and that the limitations that the world and the devil has put on you it's because they fear the power that's underneath your hood. Y'all need to let them horses out and let them run. You hear what I'm saying? Let them horses out and let them run. Let those spiritual, the spiritual side of you out. Because you heard one person who went to church one day and said, oh, I don't go there because I, I, I was scared. Those people were, were crazy. So you have lived your whole life not yielding to the Holy Spirit because one person put into your head, oh, that was scary. Yeah, come on. You don't know the situation. You don't know what has happened. But you just knew, like, well, let me, let me shy away because I want to surrender. But being a Christian is all about surrendering. You should be an expert at surrendering. I can tell you, when I get in the presence of, of God, I surrender so quick now, I'm like, okay, Jesus, I know nothing. Yeah. You know, I don't want to cut you off. I, like I, I, don't, I, I don't try to finish God's sentences like I know what he's going to say. I'm like, okay. When There's something about when the master steps in the room. Mm. Amen. Yeah. That not only in your flesh, but in your, you know, I've been standing up in my flesh, erect, like you're standing up and knowing that I'm bowing in my spirit. You ever felt like, oh, I just feel like I'm bowing down in my spirit. And I'm just falling before God in my spirit because my, because my uh, uh, spirit is so willing. But your flesh is worried about, well, you know, I wonder how often they mop this floor. I would lay on it and give God some glory, but I don't know. See, your flesh always tries to give a, an excuse to your spirit not to be, not to be obedient to it. Let, let's go to um, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Verse 38. Amen. It says, and this is what we should know. Now the just shall live by faith. Let me, let, let me stop. Are you part of the just? If you're a Christian, are you part of the... the the just or you just don't know it says the just shall live by faith what that means we live by the faith of Jesus Christ you know um, I'm kind of one of like I ain't going to argue with you about too many things you know I'll give you information but I ain't arguing with you there is listen and you'll thank me later there is nothing more that will waste your time than arguing with a fool. There's no more wasted time in your life than arguing with a fool. And at the end of arguing with a fool, you won't be mad at the fool, you'll be mad at yourself because you spent so much time arguing with this foolish situation. Amen? But when we walk by faith, we know that. Now, now this is one I want you to, to see and um, you really need to take heed on. But if anyone draws back, everybody says draws back. My soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. But of those who believe to the saving of the soul. For all my wishy-washy so-called believers who draw back. Mm. 
Listen. Do you know where this, this is a battle reference. Drawback is a battle reference. It is referencing to the soldiers who drop their shields in the middle of battle and turn and run. They draw back. So you draw your shield of faith. like brother, It ain't even retreat. They ran. Ain't nobody called a retreat button. They blew the horn. They just left. Everybody seen those, seen those um, videos where like, uh, like something like in the Civil War or whatever, and some guy goes, uh-oh. They see him come over the hill, and they throw down their weapons. They start running like this. And, uh, and, 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 and the captain goes, where y'all going? Get back up here. If you don't get back up here, I'll shoot you myself, you know? Well, when we draw back, that means you got a Christian experience. You've been saved. At the first sign of resistance to your Christianity, you draw back. So I said, oh, you, are you wanna, oh, no, no, I'm not trying to be judgy. I ain't trying to be a, um, one of those Bible thumpers. I'm not a Jesus freak. First time someone addresses you head on about your Christian faith, you draw back. The Bible says he takes no pleasure in that. Because you are to live by faith, right? But when you draw back, you drop your shield of what? Faith. Even to get to this point, you've got to get your flesh intact so you can have these armor and these weapons here. But then you, if you go from spirit to flesh 90 miles an hour, then there's an issue with you. If you can be talking about, oh, Lord Jesus, oh, I felt the spirit. And then the next time and then in the middle of that, that you turn right back in your, your flesh and you hating on everybody, then um, you have drawn back. Drawn back. Amen. And those people who usually do that end up being backsliders. Because people who drop their shield of faith and turn around and run do not know when to stop running. They'll keep running until they stop hearing a boom in the back. They could be like five miles away. I can still hear it. And they keep running in the opposite direction. Not knowing that victory were, was theirs. So you draw back right in the heat of victory and then try to come back around and get mad at those who are overcomers. Oh, they think they something now. Look. Because they go to church three times a week don't mean they're better than me. This means they know more than you, but they don't mean they're better than me. And then you tearing down, you get on Facebook, talk about, talk about the church. I mean, if the church is an easy target, but talk about the church, you know, with broad brushes. Amen. There's all these, um, all these hundreds of uh, millions or some Christians, uh, hundreds of thousands of, 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 of churches, and now you, because you had one experience, you hate them all. And, and we have to understand, when you draw back to petition, that means it's a state of, of a final spiritual ruin. A loss of the soul or damnation. So are you going to draw back to your damnation? Are you going to draw back your soul to ruin? So when you draw back from God, because, you know, some of us draw back from God because, you know, I, I'll be honest, God hits too close to home sometimes. And sometimes he hit right at home. You know, I don't know what they find over there in Israel and stuff, but God was the first inventor of, of those smart weapons. God could fire something for heaven and hit you right in the middle of your soul. God could have someone who's never met you read your mail and give you a word from him. God could have a donkey talk when men don't come to the senses. In dry places, you could hit a rock and God will make water come out. But then when God gets too close to home, we kind of freak out. And we push back. And you said, you know, that people, I see people get words from God and they fall out and they cry about how, how, how real it is. But it still wasn't enough to bring him to Jesus. But they'll tell a story at the bar where, yeah, I talked to this girl. She told me all about myself and what God was doing and, and stuff like that. It was just, it was just freaky. And people say, well, well what do you, what you, what you think it means? I don't know. It means change your life. Amen. Well, what you going to do? Oh, nothing. I thought this was a cool story. <laughs> We've all done those things where we haven't heed the signs that Jesus has given us. 
But that's part of that Christian walk. So when we when we pull back from God, we're pulling back to a place of flesh and we're pulling back to a place of, of damnation. So that's why we have to understand that there is no way out but forward. Some of my saints didn't get that. I'm going to say that again. There is no way out but forward. When you serve Jesus Christ, the back door is never an option. The king never goes to the, never enters by the servants' quarters. He comes by the front door. And if he's coming back, Lord of Lord and King of Kings, ain't none of us coming in the back way. We coming straight down the middle. We ain't going to be a sneak attack on the enemy. We're going to sound the alarm. The devil going to see us coming because just the sight of us coming makes him tremble in his boots. All the principalities and power. Remember, I talked to you about two weeks ago when I said Jesus has disarmed them all. Amen. Disarmed them all. And they see us coming with our Savior. That's why people get so uneasy when you come. It's not because I don't know why they don't like me. No, they don't like that spirit because you ain't even said anything. But that darkness in them, it's like this. Have you ever looked, you know, um, you um, drive in your car in the morning and you, and you go and the sun's coming right up as you're driving and you kind of do this and you put the blood, you know. That's how you look to people who, who are in darkness. They see you coming afar off and they're like, that's what the darkness in them sees is like. And then they try to, you know, turn around and like, okay. And then all of a sudden they don't hang out with you because they just can't. Because that light that's in you. Because the light that you are is the light of man that was in Jesus. And in Jesus there is no darkness. And when you come into them dark places, it's funny because people get mad at you because you come to dark places and it seems like the party's over. You come in, they lose their high, everybody sober up, and they're like, oh, here he comes. Messed my high up because you up in here. He just said, dude, I just came up here to borrow the lawnmower. That's all I did. Because you have to know that. So there's no reason. Listen, there's no reason, absolutely no reason that anyone can give me for you to back up from your Christianity. Amen. Well, they're talking about me. No one has given me a good reason to back up from your Christianity. People say because, because the way I, way I believe, they won't do this, they won't do that. Okay, I still don't see a good reason to back up from your Christianity. Well, my daughter or my son won't let me talk about Jesus in their house, but I still don't see a reason for you to back up from your Christianity. Amen. You're trying to get people who don't like you anyway to like you. So you're sacrificing your your eternity for someone to like you who doesn't have a heaven or hell to put you in. Amen. So why in the world would you want to impress them when they have nothing to impress you? Amen. Oh, this has got to be hitting kind of hard because because you guys' faces is kind of weird today. Okay. Everybody. Okay. And so we have to understand in this Christian thing, we do not draw back because that's like putting down your shield in a time of battle. Amen. I've been ministering 24 for, for, for years and we were going forth and I can't tell you how many people or how many sheep set down their shields and retreated and left the core on the battlefield by ourselves. On, but when God is for us, He's more than the world against us. The apostles would talk about this, uh, this disciple started out with me, but then he's not with me anymore. Yeah. I have seen so many people back up on their Christianity that I couldn't even name them all to you. And they're not better off. They're actually tormented because they know too much yeah. to be where they are. And coming to church reminds them where they're not. But they do, but they are so bound up in their mind that the devil doesn't allow them to understand it only takes a decision, one decision to change that outcome. They think it's hopeless. I don't know. I'm never going to. They think it's so hopeless. They don't understand. All you got to do is make one decision. Only person stopping you from being set free is you. 
Haven't seen anybody duct tape to their own walls lately. This is on TikTok. Haven't seen someone welded to their car. And I'm saying, so everything that you're saying is, 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 is troubling you. You're the one that asked Jesus for the key, has given you the key. And you can unlock that and walk out of this prison, this depression, this anxiety, all these things you can walk out. And what's so sad is when you get out on the other side, you think, I would have done it earlier, but you said, and you realize, I was the one that was holding me. You mean it wasn't all these people else I was blaming? Wasn't all these other, other people? It wasn't, it wasn't my granddaddy, granddaddy. It wasn't my coworkers. It wasn't my neighbor. It wasn't my roommate. You mean it was me? Yeah. It's the hardest thing to understand. But as a Christian, when you're a new creation, new, a new creature, you come out and you don't necessarily bow to the flesh. You, if, listen, if you can't tell yourself like it is, you're going to lie to everybody else. Until you get the strength to tell yourself, now that ain't right. Then you're not going to have the strength to, to, to uh, tell the devil to flee. You're not going to have the strength to cast us out. You're not going to have the strength to believe for deliverance. Because if you cannot come to a conclusion in yourself about where you are, how's anything else going to happen? Your free, willing, loving self. If you cannot see that you're lost without him, no matter how much I point it out to you, you will not say you're right. You'll say, oh, you judgy. Come on now. Right. I could walk up to a, to a guy who, who, who had a, a, a wife, three kids, a, a half a million dollar house, but now he's in the drug house and he's over in the corner and said dude you you lost everything dude this is going to send you to hell there was someone who'd be listening and says leave him alone why are you judging you need to you know everybody got their own path well i'm the only one who cares evidently you like watching that person just go to hell you see we will convince ourselves more than the devil ever did because before we lie to anybody else, we had to co-sign the lie for ourselves. Amen? Amen? Go to Ephesians 1, please. Ephesians 1, verse 13. Verse 13 says this. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also Having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So, so when does the Holy Spirit come in? When you, when you truly accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. And the gifts are the overflowing of what's in. You can't overflow in the gifts if the first flow ain't there in the first place. Amen. Okay? So when you're saved, he seals you with the Holy Spirit inside of you, who is the guarantee of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Now, let me ask you this. You're, you're, you're sealed up. You see, for all my people who are saved, you're sealed. The Holy Spirit's in you. You know you're adopted by Jesus Christ. That's your birthright. He's your access to the kingdom. He is your guarantee until the redemption of the purchase. So thing is, we're, our redemption would be once we put on the, the total redemption is when we put on our new glorified bodies when we're out of this, 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 this flesh. But it says purchase possessions. What is the purpose, the, pur the purchase, excuse me, possession that Jesus is talking about? Yep. Well, let's go and let's check this out. Let's go to um, what I leave you off. Was that Ephesians? Yeah, let's go go to uh, First Corinthians. Then this answers that question. 
First, First Corinthians six nineteen. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You are the purchased possession. You are no longer your if you're saved, you're no longer your own. He bought you with a price. Now, the Holy Spirit who is in you is the seal of your redemption of the purchased possession that Jesus purchased. What did he do? He played. He paid for you with blood. He paid for your deliverance and your access. And now you are his. He grafted. Listen, he paid for your sins, went down and adopted you, moved you in with him and grafted you in and gave you the promise of Abraham as part of his family. Now you are not. See, listen, I'm no more Richard under myself. I am Richard redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So now my surname is my redeeming's name. And now I'm not known by me. I'm known by him. I'm known by my Christian inheritance. I'm known by who I am. For as a Christian, I've been bought with a price. I've been set free from captivity. And he bought me with his blood to set me free. And not only that, he says, where I am, you shall be also. In my father's house are many mansions. He did not buy us to make us orphans. He did not buy us to put us back on the street. He bought us to protect us, to live with us, that that, um, we would be his children and he would be our God. So backing up. Is like your newfound adopted daughter or son running away from home. Running away from your inheritance. But we have such a good God that he calls our name and waits for us to turn back around when we realize what we're doing and go back to him. I don't know who this is for. I don't know who's been thinking about giving up, who's been saying, I can't do this. You're right. You can't do this. Live it and let God do it. But God doesn't want you to back up. God paid everything he had for you. And everything he would ever have. Jesus kept no blood in reserve. I want you to think about that. Every drop was shed for you. He paid it all. There's no blood in reserve just in case because there wasn't going to be no in case. This was it. This was the final negotiation. This was it. He paid for it all. And you might say, well, and and it says, you know, um, and I say I serve at the leisure of the king because before that you have freedom in your flesh and you were going to hell. I don't want to be bound to Jesus. Why got to be slave to Jesus? Well, uh, when you were a slave to sin and to your own devices, left to your own devices, you'll kill yourself. You don't believe me? Um, Leave a uh, two year old at home for a week. You'll be good if you come back to kid alive. If God left us to our own devices. Sure enough, we would get into everything that's dangerous. But God says, I'm going to walk with you, church. I'm going to be with you. I love you in the hard times, in the good times, in the, in the lonely times. I'm here for you. I want to get you over that hurdle or that, or that hump that, you, that, that you've been in. He says, but will you trust me? And this is my last scripture and I'm done. This is Romans 14. Thank you, Romans 14. Verse 17. For none of us lives to himself. How many of us live unto ourselves? If you're in Jesus, none of us live to ourselves. But it's funny how selfish Christians can be sometimes, right? And no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. 
And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We belong to Jesus. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Whether we die or we live, we're Jesus. Right now, I live in Jesus, but yet not me, but Christ who lives in me. Yet I'm crucified with him. But if I die today, I die in Christ. So that I will take that step from here to eternity where it says to be absent from the body is to be in his presence. It's a win win for the victory. But then I ask, why don't more saints have victory? Why don't we have that more deep deliverance going on? Why aren't we doing the things in Christ that he calls us to do? Well, it's simple. Because we bad. We hard-headed. We bad. So look at that. That's a bad little kid. But if, think about this. Today, if you would release the hold on your flesh, you might say, how do I do it? Listen, if you say, God, enlarge that spiritualness in me. God, allow that flesh to move away. Don't, don't let me view people or things by the flesh, but allow me to see things through the spirit. Give me my spiritual eyes. Let me see what's really going on, God. Give me my spiritual eyes. Give me wisdom and give me knowledge. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Show me the way to walk, God, and I'll walk therein. But that means you might have to say no to a couple of things sometimes. What you mean, Pastor? Like, brother, sometimes you get called out. And it's for the greater good. Sometimes you're like, you know, um, I ain't going to be able to make the last hour of that, so I got to go get this done, but then I'll be back. You do those things for the cause of Christ over and over. You're going to see the fruit. Because some of us think the evidence of the Spirit is only the gifts, like speaking in tongues, but it says the fruit of the Spirit is evident of the Spirit. Because if I didn't have the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't have meekness, kindness, long suffering, you know, temperance, all those other different things as fruits of the spirit. I don't I don't care how much you think you can slap somebody on the head and they fall. But if you ain't got the fruits of the spirit, I don't know what you're doing. You're doing WWF or something. I don't know what you're doing. Because there's no anointed in that, no anointing in that. But if you walking in the spirit and you walking in the anointing. Listen. Devils will fall. Pathways will be made clear. Valleys would raise up and mountains would come low. Crooked roads would become straight at the coming of our Lord and Savior. And if you're walking with Jesus, you're walking lock, stop, and step with Jesus. God, walk and I follow. And see how all the terrain becomes as flat as a mirror and you're walking across and the devil's trying to seek who who may devour and destroy. There's nothing like walking with the herd and looking at the lions and they can't do nothing with you. Because I ain't putting my shield so I'm walking. I'm in the herd. We're all walking. We're marching. We got a thing. Lions on both sides and lions just kind of looking and seeing and, and, and we're inside and we're encouraging each other. Hey, Keep your head up. Look straight ahead. Look straight ahead. Look straight ahead. Hey, get informed. Don't don't get out. Don't don't get out from away from us. You know, I'm on, you know, you, I know you took like a, a five year sabbatical from church and the devil's been eating on you. But don't get back out there. Stay, stay, stay. And your goal is to make when you march by that every lion be just hungry and thirsty yeah, come on. and mad. And you say, not this herd. Go on. But he's waiting for one of y'all to slip up and drop your shield of faith. And what that looks like is if Jesus wasn't there, I believe Peter would have sank all the way down. But when he took his eyes off Jesus, only then did he start to sink. Saints, the American church has been taking their eye off of Jesus. We follow Jesus the way we drive. We're so distracted 
We have so many accidents and so many things. And we follow Jesus the same way. Jesus followed me. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then why you keep doing that, he gets further and further ahead. It's like your kids, when you take them to the store, they see toys and they don't realize that you done went on to three hours back. But I look at the toy, look up, they're like, Mom! Mom! And you come back like, boy, I told you follow me. And that's when you tie that kid to the cart, they're like this. <laughs> because they get so distracted that they lose a grown person. Look, I lose Dennis all the time. I don't care how big he is, that boy ninja. Because you, you can talk to him, I, I do like this, looked up, he's like, well, where'd he go? And if I had a dollar for every, every time his daughter and his wife were looking for him, where's Dennis at? I said, he went out that way. I just came out that way looking for him. And they'll go out that way, and Dennis come back, and says, I didn't see her. I said, she just went out looking for you. Yeah. You see, we got to understand, if God is our focus, I want you to hear me right now. I'm, I'm, I'm done. If God is our focus... Why is our vision so blurry of what he wants us to do? Amen. If God is supposed to be our focus, why do more Christians say, well, I just don't know. I don't know what God's doing. I don't know what he's doing. But if he's our focus, why is our Christian life so blurry? Amen. Some Christians, we confuse non-saved people. They're like, well, I don't know. You know, like poor Kanye West. He's put out a gospel album, had Sunday service. Now he's thinking about, um, about starting a uh, production um, porn site video, a porn production. How you become so when you lose sight? When you're not surrounded by individuals who can push you in the right way. You see, we're at this point in our life, in the world, in, in America, where, where um, the devil is ripe to pull off Christian stragglers. Because things are getting real, y'all. Yeah, Some of you say, I don't want to hear that stuff, you know. And I read on the, on the internet, I mean, people are, now they're they, they, they going in. I read some stuff where um, so-called Christians have said some things. I read some stuff where people are like, you know, they, they hate Jesus. And, and they say Jesus ain't real, and and that's a bunch of bull. I hate Jesus. I'm like, you know, I think you believe he's real. What do you mean? I don't see you getting this mad about Ronald McDonald. He ain't real. I ain't seen you show a fit about that. But you sit in a fit about Jesus that he ain't real. That means you must think he is. You know, I don't see you going down there and, and um, complaining about Superman or, or, um, or uh, Kung Fu Panda. I ain't seen you doing that. But let somebody say about Jesus and you just say, oh, they're, they're, they're brainwashed. No, I'm telling you, the gloves are off now. They've been off for a while, but they're totally off now here. Even where we're at, they're totally off. People are going to hate you, not because you did anything, not because you said anything, because you say you love Jesus. That's now. You will feel it pretty soon. Pretty soon, if you keep posting enough Christian stuff, they'll, they'll chime in. And what's so crazy is they'll be your friend list. They'll be your, your friends. Yeah. And you're like, well, you know, and because they're your friends, you'll be tempted to back up. Well, I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, everybody is, every, everything's okay, whatever. No, this is a time of battle. Are you going to stand? Amen. Even, cause they, even though they're on your, on your friend request or your friends list, are you going to stand and say, hey, I said what I said. Jesus is real. I said what I said. Yeah. You know, keep it strolling. But I said what I said. Yeah. You know, a lot of us, we want to back up because we want to be nice. Amen. But loving Jesus is not hate. So you have to choose. The choice is yours. Are you going to walk this Christian life and be a Christian? It means Christ like. Even when they ask Jesus, Jesus says, Well, you have are you the Christ? Just tell us plainly. He says, You have you have said, you have said so. I've done many deeds, yet you do not believe. So, is what is Jesus to you right now, this very minute? What is He to you? Oh, He's my, He's my Savior. He's my Lord. Well, then act like it. Amen. Walk in it. 
Let's stand. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing. I believe someone is needing to get delivered today. I believe someone is, have been asking God to change something in your life. I believe he can do that right now. Holy Father, I ask you, God, that um, you're able to, to move in to these people's lives. That you're able to, to change and fix broken things. That your love would just go in and let them know, Father, take down everything that, that fear or hurt or anger that's stopping him, Father, right now. God, have your way today. Some precious souls here today. If you haven't known Jesus, we ask that you would come and accept him as Lord and Savior, that you accept him and you would have a internal heart change today at this altar. If you backslidden or backed up on God, you come back and say, God, I'm coming back to you full force. And come and pray. You can kneel at the altar and your own way and seek God if that's what you choose. But don't choose hell. Don't choose a life without serving God. His love is boundless. Right now, someone says, Pastor, you know, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, but I need delivered from X, Y, and Z, whatever it is. Come to, the, come to one of these brothers and says, you know, I'm coming for deliverance, coming for salvation. I'm coming to renew my faith back in Jesus Christ. You come. This altar's open. Hello, everyone. For everyone who loves to donate to Higher Praise Worship Center, we have a new text to give number. The text to give number is 888 three six four 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 eight three and then you text hpwc812 hpwc812 and it will prompt you how to give god bless and thank you